Thanks so much for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. I made the long haul from New York to Toronto today, all of one hour on a plane. It's kind of crazy. I told my, my wife that, um, you know, I was going to wake up in my bed and go to bed in my bed, but I was going to go to a different country in between. So that's kind of a, a fun little fact for the day. Um, as Sandy alluded to, uh, I've been in the field of arbor culture all of my life. My father's an arborist, and uh, he's been an inspiration to me. And eventually I got involved with New York City Parks, which is an amazing organization. And I know that some of you are now somewhat familiar with us uh, through some of my colleagues and, uh, and senior uh, staff that have been here before. And you know, we're doing some pretty radical and amazing things in the way of urban forestry. So I'm, uh, again, very humbled and happy to be here with you all. And with that, I'm going to just get started here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to first start with uh, the concepts behind our Young Street Tree Printing Program, talk a little bit, give you a little bit of context as to how we got there, and then talk about it a little bit more in depth, and even give you a tiny bit of a, um, give you sort of a crash course in Young Street Tree Printing for those of you who are somewhat interested. Um, so why is it important to structurally prune a tree, right? So you have to think about this as um, a big picture uh, sort of issue, right? Throughout uh, the last seven years, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, of Million Trees NYC, we've been procuring trees and um, we've been planting them and they cost us thousands of dollars, right? They cost us millions of dollars, right? Because we have these million dollar, two million dollar contracts, two or three of them sometimes per borough, right, in our city. And um, we plant them all throughout the uh, public right of way. And, if, unfortunate, and, and, and fortunately, those trees are assets, right? But if we don't maintain them, they can become a serious, serious maintenance problem. And then, therefore, they could obviously lose value, right? So these are some uh, sort of comical but drastic examples of trees that needed some serious structural pruning, needed to be addressed in, in, um, you know, in, in younger age, right? You can see the one all the way over there on your right, my left, where you've got multiple stems, this one who is clearly lead, uh, who is leaning one way and going back the other. These are, these are notable uh, structural issues. This is an example of a tree. I took this picture after Hurricane Sandy. Right? This, is, uh, this is an instance where there were a number of multiple leaders on a tree, a structural issue that can be easily addressed in the, um, at the tree's youngest age, uh, or youngest you know, formative years. But unfortunately, it wasn't taken care of. And I just want to remind you guys that when I'm talking about this stuff, I'm not at all um, insulting or trying to put down our maintenance process. I'm more trying to put an emphasis on the fact that maintenance is very, I think, equally as important in the big circle of things, right? You've got this incredible management uh, and strategy for planting trees, especially with an emphasis on equality, right? Being planted through all sorts of neighborhoods, rich and poor, dense and very residential, whatever it might be. So now this is the back end of it, and we have to find a way to integrate them. So that, that's my mission with the Young Street Tree Program. program. Here's another Incredible example, right? This is, I'm showing you drastic examples because I think that they tend to ring the best, right, in our minds, right? These are the things we remember, right? Close to a public right of way, this massive branch that's really as big as any tree, right, falling, and because there's a pocket of decay, um, perhaps this was, you know, two, these were two branches that were gr growing very closely together, a lot of water got stuck between them, became a focal point for decay, and bam, right, many years later. So. Let's put it, in, put it all into context, right, before I started to allude to Million Trees NYC, and I'm sure that my colleagues have talked about this. I think to date, we're somewhere in the 900,000s at the moment. I don't have the exact snapshot of the website, but you can always go to milliontreesnyc.org and check. But I think we're close to 930,000, if not more. And, it, and we're actually, it was projected to, it started in, 20, in 2007, and was supposed to end in 2017, but we're actually going to be finished with our million number this year. Mm. But that doesn't mean that, you know, when the ticker clicks to a million, we all go, well, that was great, see you later, right? And walk out the door, turn off the lights. There's a lot of work that's left to be done. And of course, our street tree planting program will remain, and planting throughout the city's public right-of-ways and also public spaces will remain. It's just that, um, again, it's the idea of integrating, right? So Million Trees NYC started through this through the mayor's initiative, and uh, we've been going very strong ever since. 
as you can see here, starting in 1991, right, and, and moving all the way. This is actually a little bit out of date because obviously we're past 2014. I think in 2014 we planted um, from street trees alone. I want to say close to. I think it was. I think it's about 20,000, if not 22,000. I could be somewhat off on that, but um, we project basically the same thing for the next few years, and we just received also. $18 million from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, uh, to make up for all the damages lost in Hurricane Sandy, which we experienced in 2012. So there are a lot of new trees going into New York. right? So this is sort of a fun image that I like to show everybody. Uh, this was after the first uh, two seasons of Million Trees NYC. Right? And you can see how our tree population and density is being focused, mm -hmm. and I want to emphasize these images specifically because um, if there is no laser pointer, is there? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. So this right here is Staten Island, right? And that dense area sort of on the uh, east coast of Staten Island is called Stapleton. Then all the way up the, the northernmost county, that, that southwest pocket, that's Morrisani and Hunts Point. In Manhattan, you guys probably all know Manhattan Island, that's East Harlem. Queens, which is the largest borough um, further north to the east. We have Jamaica and parts of Astoria and Flushing, uh, which are those little dense pockets. And then we have on the border of Queens and Brooklyn, which is right here. Oh, sorry, in Queens also is this area called the Rockaways, which was heavily impacted by the Hurricane Sandy. And then <clears throat> over there, that pocket between those two counties, those two boroughs, is called East New York. And the reason I emphasize this is because these are the areas that we uh, targeted in planting, so we have lots and lots of what's called block planting uh, happening there, which is basically like, as opposed to somebody calling and saying, hey, can I get a tree in front of my house? We're saying, this area has a high population density. Um, Department of Health, in conjunction with parks, did a lot of studies as to asthma rates and congestion. Um, population density, right, as I was saying before. Uh, high pollution and low canopy cover. So we decided that this is also part of what's called a Trees for Public Health initiative. Okay, so we targeted many, many, many plantings in all those areas and other areas, as you can see, a lot of other outlier areas. And of course, we still have the request-based system too, where somebody would call. But so we took these block planting areas and started to apply them to our Young Street Tree Printing Program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I want to continue with this. So this is so as you can see, right. The, I mean, look at, look at the difference, right? Look at Staten Island alone. Right? Ready? Bam? Bam. Right? And you can just see how many trees have been planted. And this is actually the most recent graphic from this past fall, which is, which is crazy. I mean, we've planted so many trees on our, on our public right-of-ways. So how did we do that, right? Um, did my colleague Matt talk at all about tree procurement? Okay, good. I'm, only gonna, I'm not going to go into it too much, and you can always feel free um, you know, after the lecture during Q&A or whatever to ask me and then, uh, of course, you know, you can contact me. But basically, we have this amazing tree procurement program, which I helped to run, um, in which we have two contracted nurseries that grow trees for us, right? The main aim, as, as Sandy said in her description, is that, um, is to increase the biodiversity, right? Because we're planting all these trees and obviously we want a very diverse population, species richness. But it's also to dramatically improve the quality of the tree that we're getting, right? As we all know, well, maybe some of us here, I'm, I'm not sure about everybody's background, but um, there's a, there's, there tends to be a huge disagreement between silviculture, or the nursery industry, and forestry and, and arbor culture. Arborists and foresters see trees in one way, and nurserymen and women tend to see, it, tend to see them in another way. And both ways, you could argue, are probably somewhat utilitarian, right? But a nursery is typically thinking about a tree just as um, money, right? This, it's the product. It's the product that they sell. And so oftentimes, a lot of uh, you know, the basic fundamentals of how a tree grows tend to be ignored, right? We're talking about the depth at which a tree is planted throughout its time at the nursery and at which it's harvested. And luckily this program, and I'm not going to say that it hasn't been without its challenges and bumps, right, has managed to severely increase um, the quality at which we're procuring our trees now. And not only that, when, when we procure 20,000 trees in a season, 11, or in a year, and 11,000 trees in a season, right, we're talking about dramatic, you know, a huge number of trees and pretty much every one of them at the highest quality that you can get. And of course, as I'm 
going to be talking about young street tree pruning, we're also specifying how that tree is pruned at its formative stages to make sure that it not only has a great root system and has a beautiful looking head, but that it's also a sustainable tree, right? This isn't something that's just going to blow over in a couple of years. So, I always like this picture because you can just see how uniform those trees are. I'm not saying every one of those trees is perfect, but almost every one of those trees is perfect. This was a block of like 400 Zelkovas, and I think that we were able to procure about 350 of them, right? So, that's pretty amazing. Um, and at one point, I think my uh, colleague and I, because, again, and this has everything to do with the fact that the nurseries are so into it, because if you're a nurseryman and the city has contracted you and told you, hey, I'm going to buy like thousands and thousands and thousands of trees from you, you'd think that they were, they'd be like, oh my god, this is amazing. You know, this doesn't usually happen, right? Nurseries don't get that type of business all the time. So luckily, these guys have been extremely accommodating and really, really, really um, love doing what they do for us and growing these trees. And we're able to, you know, honestly, every tree is assessed very quickly, but since they're all so uniform, it's, it, we're, we're almost, we're like 99% positive that every tree we, we put our, we put a seal of approval, a literal tag, right, um, is, is basically going to be of the same exact quality, the same high quality. So lowland trees, right, trees, this is Carpinus betulus, fastigiata, um, European hornbeam. Traditionally, grow more like a hedge, right? This is a this is a tree that landscape architects tend to love. Um, as it grows wider, it, you know, it starts to fan out a little bit. Vestigiata, right? Vestigit might actually be a little bit of a misnomer, in my opinion. I mean, it is somewhat upright, but then it really begins to spread. Regardless of that fact, as you can see, right? Traditionally grown lowland, but we actually have it highland. And at this stage, right, these pruning cuts are no bigger really than like my thumb or perhaps my middle finger. So these are easy uh, wounds for a young tree that's being taken care of very well to close up, right? Oops, excuse me. Poor structure in development stages. This is something that we try to avoid, right? This has everything to do with staking and developing good trunk taper and uh, pruning appropriately. But you can see this, uh, this isn't just in our nurseries, this happens in every nursery. Um, Unfortunately, the mechanics of a tree and the way that a tree works are, are not always taken into account. And that's one of the things that we've continuously tried to address. You can see oversized wounds on really small stems, right? Um, the middle picture is, is, a, is a tree at almost liner stage, uh, which means that it's usually come from one of those massive farms out on the west coast that you know, has this amazing lush volcanic soil where they can just propagate trees like, like Ailanthus seeds, right? They just like pop out of the ground. It's, it's kind of amazing. But anyway, so they get shipped uh, out to the East Coast, to Maryland, and to Long Island, which is where our nurseries are. And, you know, hopefully they're eventually staked properly. You can see more trees sort of like the ones further uh, in the background of that picture, right? But, again, we're trying to encourage uh, the proper uh, and healthy growth of our trees. So how do we do it? This guy's name is John, John Zapala, and he is the owner of Whitman Nurseries, which is one of our tree procurement nurseries. And you can see, right, look at this. So on, on my, on his, uh, just behind him are more rows of Zelkova, and actually right next to him are uh, some, gra some six-foot grafted cherries. And uh, I actually saw some of these wandering around the campus before, but this is an incredible thing. This is not a very widely available tree, and those who, you know, want sort of like an ornamental landscape in their front yard probably don't want a six-foot grafted cherry because it's kind of, it's just kind of silly looking. But for us, for our purposes, you know, as a, as a municipality, as, as an organization that is planting trees in the public right-of-way, right, this, you can see, John, John's taller than me, John's about 6'3", and he can walk under that without really any trouble whatsoever. So that's an amazing thing, because we're also trying to plant trees in the right place, right? We're going for maximizing um, canopy cover with larger trees, but where, we, where there's uh, challenges such as utilities, I'm sure my colleagues have talked about this, we try to plant smaller trees, but um, taking into account the fact that a lot of smaller trees traditionally are limbed very low, we try to have them grafted and limbed high from a young age so that they can grow appropriately and safely in the city while maintaining the safety of our citizens. So this is a quick snapshot of some of the um, specifications that we wrote out in our tree procurement contracts. I'll give you guys a second to read through it. All right, great. So I referred to this before, right? Years one and two, very important. Formation of good trunk taper and trunk strength, right? So 
we, we don't encourage the use of a, of a stake right off the bat, right? Because a stake is just so controlling on the, on the movement of that tree, right? And so <clears throat> throughout its first couple of years, we're hoping that, you know, the natural tendency of the tree to move back and forth with the wind will help it develop trunk taper, okay? And then years uh, one to three, this is now where we're usually uh, allowing that, excuse me, usually it's in year three that we're allowing them to place a stake and we're trying to help to develop the central leader, right? And the central leader is so important. And when I talk about young street tree pruning to our parks employees and to stewards, I'm always emphasizing the fact that the development of a central leader, where possible, is integral to um, lesser maintenance costs, usually, right? Because typically with a, a, a central leader, a, a, nice, a nicely formed central leader, you have less structural problems and you can encourage that ex-current growth that you want, right? It's not possible with every tree. It's certainly not possible with those six-foot grafted cherries. But believe it or not, um, trees that are, tend to be more deep current, like, um, like Zelkova, right, which is much more of a vase shape, even certain elms, right, we can actually encourage the growth of a central leader, which we're hoping in the future will indeed cut down on maintenance costs because it will be much easier, it will be a much more straightforward maintenance process to just you know, get rid of crossing branches as opposed to subordinating, you know, full, huge branches that could potentially be breaking the tree. So <clears throat> here in years two and three, right, we're spacing the scaffolding branches. So main branches should be uh, distributed regu regularly and vertically along the trunk, um, forming a generally symmetrical crown. We're not looking for this, like, beautiful, like, perf you know, perfect triangle, um, but we <coughs> want a good, healthy crown. Um, and we certainly don't want too many branches all located in one place, right? Because that will end up becoming a focal point for breakage, right? And structural problems. Um, main branches, for the most part, shall be well spaced, and branch diameter shall be no greater than two thirds the diameter of the trunk. This is primarily, right, so that we don't have these oversized branches. And if we needed to make a pruning cut, it wouldn't be so overly huge on the trunk of the tree, okay? And you can see that we provided some examples, right? The preferable versus unacceptable. And then finally, the attachment of the scaffold branches shall be free of included bark. Um, can I just get a quick poll in here? Because I want to know how much experience is in here with regards to structural pruning of any sort. Can, can we just get a quick hand raise? Who's done it? Yeah, who's done, who's done structural pruning or knows about structural pruning? OK, great. Who, who sorry, and another question. Who here is, um, who work, works in forestry? Not necessarily academia, but works in forestry. Okay, that's great. And then who is in ac ac the academic part of forestry? Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, all right, that's that's cool. And then and then so the rest of so the rest of the folks here are, are is that mostly stewards, or okay, it's fine. I, 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 I'm just I'm just trying to gauge the audience because it definitely helps with regards to you know how we how in depth I decide to go on on some of this stuff. Excuse me, this is the wrong slide. So, um, you know, all of our trees are grown to ANSI, which is the American uh, National Standards Institute. There's, if you guys don't know about the ANSI standards, there's an ANSI standard from everything to being, from being a mechanic to brain surgery to growing a tree in a nursery. So it, it really is, uh, you know, it, it, it widely varies. But as with everything government related, you need a standard, right, so that you have something to measure by, right? And so, um, we're saying that type one shade trees, this, this actually gets a little too much into the contract, so it won't go totally between that. But basically, the tree that we harvest is two and a half to three inch caliper, so that's six inches above the root flare, where the, where the trunk meets the roots, right? And, um, and just something that's, um, that's really important, we try to have branch height usually between five and six feet. That usually provides ample clearance, even when the tree is young, right? And um, and again, you know, I referred, I, I, I alluded to this earlier, which is that when the tree is, um, when the tree, is, I just blank, excuse me. Oh, when the tree is harvested, we have to, we're always trying to emphasize, you know, making sure that the root flare is indeed exposed and excavated, because remember that a bald and burlap tree, when it is harvested from a nursery, typically it loses up to about 80% of its root mass. So it's extremely important that the tree should already be grown, right, loved it at the correct height, but in case it isn't, we always make sure that that, that, that um, 
that the soil is removed from, uh, from on top of the root layer in order to accommodate for that. So we have as much root mass as we can uh, by the time the tree is planted. So <clears throat> past and current methods for a young tree tree pruning, right? Tangible results driven by time and practice and a slice of humble pie. And I say this because this is, this, this is a very young program, right? It's been around for three years, um, three and a half years, really, because we had like sort of a half year pilot. And this, this is really the meat and potatoes of my presentation today, because I wanted to give you a little bit of context as to, you saw the tree procurement, right, which gives us these amazing quality trees. You see, you saw those block planting maps where we we're planting, you know, hundreds of thousands of street trees throughout our city. So now the next component is what happens after that, right? The trees are under guarantee for two years, right, after the contractor plants them. But then, what happens after that? So my colleagues and I have been trying to think about, like, that exact question. What happens, right? Because our borough forestry offices are much more focused on a tree that's 10 times, 15, 20 times the size of the tree that is two years out of guarantee, right? Because that tree could, God forbid, hurt somebody, right? If it dropped a limb or if it fell, right? It could, it could ruin a house, right? Whereas a tree that's, you know, probably eight or 10 years old at the most, isn't, it probably is not going to cause extensive damage. It could, you know, God forbid, poke an eye out, but it probably wouldn't kill a person. Right? And I'm not trying to sound callous here, I'm just trying to show the magnitude. But that doesn't mean that the tree still doesn't need to be addressed, right? So, we went through all these phases, right? We're we, we've been trying to strategize as the years have gone on, like, plant. How do we prioritize where we're going to, um, where, where we're going to, uh, to prune these trees, right? And we've based that specifically on our block planting models, right? So in those five or six focal neighborhoods that I, that I showed you guys earlier, and now that, we're, now that we're in a little bit, and I'll show you the numbers a little bit later, um, we're starting to branch out a little bit more into some of the other areas that we, that we focused a lot of our plantings on. Inventory and purchasing of tools and equipment. The staff that's doing this is horticulture staff. This is staff that typically is doing, um, you know, shrub, some tree maintenance, a lot of perennial maintenance. That's the thing with, you know, government programs. It's not always the easiest to start them. And unfortunately, I was talking about this with Eric and Sandy before, maintenance is not sexy, right? We all know that, right? Million Trees NYC has this like beautiful banner, it's got all these NGOs that are involved with it. Pruning? I mean, there's probably a bunch of stewards out there that are down with pruning, but almost everybody wants to put their hands on a little tree and plant it and be like, I planted that tree 6,000 years ago, look at it now, right? But no one is like, hey, dude, I pruned that tree like last year, look at it. <laughs> Right? Because everyone's like, cool. Did you plant it? And everyone's like, no, that wasn't me. Okay, so you get the point, right? It's not, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the, the appeal, right? That, um, that government typically wants, or that, that really gets the attention, right? That, that, that gives you the money and the funding and the power, the manpower to do what you need to do. And that's okay, right? And so we've come up with a creative solution to use this horticulture staff, who usually during the winter, um, which we've determined is like generally our young street tree pruning season, um, is not nearly as busy, you know, maintaining our little parks and playgrounds and planting perennials and stuff like that because it's winter. So we procure tools for them, including pole clippers and hand pruners and hand saws, etc. And we send them out, right, with all these maps. Um, and these are examples of some of the maps. This is actually Stapleton, that neighborhood in Staten Island that I showed you earlier. And that's actually uh, part of East New York, which is in Brooklyn. And um, anyway, you can, you can see, right? You, you can see by the color coding, Prune Streets versus uh, this right here. 2007 to 2010 means that that's when it was planted, and therefore those trees are now eligible, right? Because there is that two-year guarantee, and we don't want the contractors getting all, you know, hit, um, getting all pissed off, I guess, for lack of a better term, because we're meddling with their trees, right? So we sort of leave those trees to be out of guarantee and then prioritize them. But seeing as there's such a concentrated population in these areas, these are the areas that we, can, that we try to prioritize. So <clears throat> this is where the sort of humble pie aspect comes in, and I'll, and I'll elaborate. When we started this class, um, Actually, it's kind of funny, right? Here I am, right? A young professional from this professional office, right? Um, who is trying to, you know, get a message. Every one of you is a professional, or you're a steward, and you're really into it. 
Not every gardener is into youngster tree pruning, right? And most gardeners are outdoor people. So when you put them in a warm classroom and you try to give them a PowerPoint presentation, it just doesn't work, right? <laughs> now, I'm not a certified teacher, but I began to notice that this was not working. And I'll, and I'll explain why. Right, so we had these large presentations. This is my colleague, Joe. And you know, th this is some of the horticulture staff in Manhattan. And we're teaching them. And we're going all over all, the, all the, um, you know, the, the really core concepts, right? Tree health, right? How does that impact your decision making? How much of this tree are you going to prune, right? Tree habit and structure. Is this an X current or D current tree? Or is it spreading or is it, does it grow straight up and down, right? Impact on technique and focus, right? And then, of course, tying it into tree health. And then actually the execution of cuts, right? And then and talking specifically about the types of equipment and when to use. So I told I showed you the pole clipper, right? Or is this a pole or is this a pruner moment or is this a saw moment, whatever it might be. And while we did have a field portion, we realized that it wasn't all perfect, right? This like hour and a half indoors, something was happening, right? I was talking to you, but the the words that I was saying were kind of just bouncing off of heads. And, I'm not, and, it, and it has absolutely nothing to do with level of intelligence and capability. It's just that um, pe people like the horticulture staff, that, most of the horticulture staff that, um, that work for parks, tend to be hands-on folks. They're, pr they're practitioners, right? They need to be there. They need, need to be doing it. They can't have some youngin come in and be like, so this is included bark. You like included bark? It's pretty cool, right? It, doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. So, and I, and I used to go through this like really complex sort of like crazy flow chart called the Young Tree Pruning ABCs. <laughs> this comes from Chris Lulee, if you guys know him, he lives across the lake. Fantastic, incredible person, right? Um, and, and it works, and it works for, for, for certain people, and it, for certain uh, types of people, and certain learners, right? Types of learners in our profession, right? People can look at this and be like, oh, I get it. Like, apical dominance, bad branches, competing branches, uh, poor health. It, but some people don't get that, right? And so again, so I have to start, and we taught this way for two years. Now we're in the third year of the program, and I have drastically changed it, and I'll show you, and I'll and I'll show you that in a little bit. But so so what were the so what were the pros and cons, right? Now I'm not going to say that uh, that I've taken the material and drastically changed it. I just changed my approach to it. The pros: longer classes allowed instructors to teach material at a much more scientific level. That's good, right? Because people understand the scientific concepts behind it. It allowed a little bit more time for Q&A. And it was warmer, because it's really cold outside in the winter, right? Then we put on our coats and everything, and we'd go outside. But as I alluded to before, some of the cons, right? Hort staff, horticulture staff, are not indoor students, right? They're tactile. They need, to, they need to be there. They need to hold the pruner. They need to hold the saw. They need to make the cut while you tell them yes or no, OK? Not enough time devoted to reinforcing concepts outside. It's all well and good if you can explain the scientific reason for you know, not making a flush cut right now to all of you in the, in the classroom. But until we go out there and see an example of a tree that's starting to inroll over itself or has a huge crack, right, you're not going to completely understand. Right? Or until you get the inside view of it, you're not going to completely understand. When and then I said before, when attendees are hands-on learners, lecture-style pedagogy is not effective. Oops, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. So, <clears throat> uh, at the end of sort of every young tree pruning season, I would go out with my camera and a, a pruner in case I needed to do anything corrective. But I would always take a picture, right? Because, and, and believe me, th I'm just showing you guys some, some, uh, some moments of uh, sort of poor choices made, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that it was all like this. There was, there was plenty of good work out there, right? And I just wanna, um, recognize that right now, okay? But there were some problems, right? And I realized that something I was trying, my, my colleagues and I were trying to teach was not coming through, right? And this is like a very big problem because we're trying to uh, address the maintenance issues of young trees at, its, at their most formative stage. This is the moment where we could potentially lengthen the life and uh, the life and durability of this tree on a city street, probably by 10 years, by making five cuts and walking away. But if we screw it up, then we've done more damage than good, right? If this branch here had remained, it probably wouldn't have been the end of the world. But now there's this massive oversized flush cut, right? 
this crossing branch on that, right? Why wasn't that corrected? I didn't understand because I was fairly sure that in this, it was pretty clear, wasn't it? <laughs> it's not, and I get that, right? <laughs> right? Or but, but, but wait, wait, wait. What, what, what about that broken branch? Isn't that in the B? Isn't that the B? That's the B of ABCs, right? But no, it didn't always work. Okay. So, um, so that, so that's the thing. So it, so it took me a little bit, and it took me, it took me a few months. Uh, to, to sort of like process all of this. And in the meantime, I was sending, um, I was sending the hort managers, right, the, the horticulture staff's bosses, my feedback. And I'd show them both pictures that were not so good and pictures that were better. Um, and then in the subsequent years, this was after 2013 and 2014, I showed the hort staff these pictures and there was a, a, a very large um, sort of like jump in quality, right? But it still wasn't there. Like I, I didn't understand why it still wasn't better, right? These people had not done it like two to three years because we had the pilot program. And in 2014, I was still seeing a lot of the same stuff at a, at a smaller scale, but it's still every pruning cut. Honestly, I really, really, really strive for perfection, right? Pruning thousands of trees a year, here's some of the data, right? 21,900, let's call it 22,000 trees were pruned citywide through the Young Street Tree Pruning Program. In 2013, there were uh, 11,258 trees pruned, which surpassed the goal of 9,300 by 20%. That was at a very large cost with regards to quality, right? Um, and in fiscal year 2014, we surpassed the goal of 10,000. See, you see this huge jump, right? From 20% to 7%, right? Um, and that's because the quality did improve so much. I somehow was starting to get through Right to, and, and it was probably also a product of reinforcement. I can't take all the credit, right? It's not, I'm not the one doing it, right? And so as I said before, I provided reports to work managers describing positive and negative aspect, and aspects of work and suggestions for improvement, right? In 2014, the quality of pruning cuts vastly improved, and also data tracking, which had previously been dubious at best, largely improved due to improved maps and tracking strategies. So some of those maps that you guys saw were some of our latest maps, and it really helped the words have to understand where they were, where they needed, excuse me, where they needed to go, so that they wouldn't uh, over prune trees that they had pruned last year, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then there were my observations, right? Some of my observations that I haven't really talked about yet is that I realized that people were totally okay with limbing up trees, right? Taking that, taking out the lower branches, because that is really the bread and butter of this. It's the meat and potatoes, as we say, right? Um, because you're right. If you're walking along and there's a branch right here, the easiest thing to do is, is to remove it. But there wasn't enough emphasis, maybe in, my, in, in, our, in our classes, I'm not sure, on using pole tools like pole clippers and pole saws to subordinate co-dominant leaders, right? And I didn't know if it, and we provided all these tools. So I was saying, where is the, if there's just no confidence level, right? Is it because of inexperience? And that's fine. Like, when I was young, my dad used to make me use a pole pruner and I hated it. You're craning your neck the whole time, and you've got this thing that wants to wobble. It, you know, which way? It, it, it's terrible. But once you get to knowing how to use it effectively, it's actually not hard at all. And so I said, man, it's a combination of maybe a little bit of confidence, but also just like actually, again. And, and this is where I was like, man, these people are these are hands-on people, right? You, you got to just go out there with them. And um, so, so that was it. I was doing a lot of quality control, observations, had my slices of humble pie, maybe in a whole pie of it, I don't know, right? And that's how I helped it, and that's how I came up with the curriculum for this past year. And what it, and the way it came about, I just remember sitting at my desk, right? Um, because <clears throat> I was sitting at my desk and I was like trying to kind of make the PowerPoint again, and then I was like, screw the PowerPoint. I was like, when I was a kid, right, my dad handed me some pruners and said, prune that holly. And I said, well, it has, you know, it has sharp leaves, and he's like, too bad, prune the holly, right? And then I thought to myself, man, you know, all this time I've been beating around the bush. I haven't accepted the fact that people sometimes just need to get their hands on and do stuff, right? So I ditched the PowerPoint altogether, okay? And <laughs> ditched the presentation on with explanation, said by me, circa 2014 November. Right, and that was an, and so that that was my epiphany, right? And so now I'm gonna give you all the pleasure of walking through the PowerPoint version of the course that I gave uh, my that I gave to our 
um, to our core people. And instead what I did was I basically came up with this packet, right? This is something they can bring with them. They can't bring a PowerPoint with them. So it was it, so now they actually have the concepts in their hands, right? And um, I have to give some credit here to my lovely fiance because she is a teacher and she was like, dude, think about the way you're teaching. And I, and I realized that this was much more of a deliverable, right? This wasn't a deliverable to my superiors. This was a deliverable to the people that were going to be executing the work. So that if ever they had these moments of like, oh man, how do I use this? Or is this right? Or what am I, what am I trying to, what's my first step? It says tree help? I, I, don't, I don't remember. They could just look at this, right? So, so I'm going to sort of do an abridged version of this and run through it with you because typically what I did was I would have this, we would be standing like in the nursery room before we all went out and practiced and instead of being an hour and a half lecture style PowerPoint, this was like a half an hour and then we devoted two and a half to three hours of just pruning together. So it would be me and maybe a colleague, but usually just me and a group of like 20 court staff all pruning together. And they'd be like, hey, Nave, is that, uh, can, how do I use my pull clipper here? Or, oh, I totally, you know, there's like, of course, the few people that are like, oh, I totally know how to do this, but they don't know how to do it. And you have to be very, very, very tactful in telling them that they're not doing it correctly. And, but it's, it's all good because that's, that's, that's learning, right? That's learning. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect either. So <clears throat> I went through this, right? Young tree pruning best practices, and now this is also taken from, from an ANSI standard, right? American National Standards Institute, right? And so we, were, so we discussed develop or maintain a dominant leader, right? And this totally depends on a habit of the tree, which I'll cover in a second. Identifying the lowest branch in the permanent canopy. And the, so basically deciding, like, what is, the, what is the branch that I want to keep, right? When I walk away from this tree, what is the lowest branch? Prevent branches below the permanent canopy from growing too large. Okay, so if the branch, so if the lowest branch that I want to keep in the canopy, let's say that it's at um, seven feet, right? But the branch below it's really big, right? And I can't remove it altogether because we were thinking about tree health, and we were thinking about the fact that a pruning cut that's too large on the trunk. We know this, right? Maybe what we do instead is is subordinate or to shorten the branch, right? So that to to suppress growth now and come back in the future. Space main branches along dominant trunk, and so I was to allow the, the flow of light and air, right, through a tree to promote healthy growth. And finally, suppressing growth on branches with included water. And one of the things that I constantly had to reemphasize, um, which I found interesting, is that, you know, and I think it has to do with the fact that um, most court staff are trained for ornamental pruning, right? They're trying to focus on flowers, right, or, um, a shrub looking extra bushy, right? Or you know, whatever it might be, right? But this is structural pruning. And a lot of times I did let them know that structural pruning and ornamental pruning can go hand in hand, but they don't always, right? So your tree might look a little wonky after you leave it, but it's probably better off if you've done the right thing. And so um, suppressing branches, it's spreading growth on branches with included bark. I really, really emphasize that. And look, I reworked the flow chart. It's, now, it's no longer just now a bunch of bubbles and, you know, but now it just, it made sense to people, right? So first things first, right? We said, look at tree for safety. And we're like, okay, if it's a dangerous tree, be very careful. One. Then look it up for form, right? And we talked about X current and D current. And then, of course, we're assessing tree health. And we talked about percentages, right? <clears throat> uh, I'll even pose this to the, to the class right here. If a tree is an identical, if it's identical, if a tree is in ideal circumstances, let's say it's planted in a lawn, right, uh, in a botanic garden where someone's taking great care of it, what is the maximum percentage that you would want to prune from that tree? Yes. 25 to 30 percent is what they typically say, right? Now I have to remind everybody that we're planting, that we're pruning street trees. Are street trees in ideal conditions? Obviously not, right? Street tree's health is constantly compromised and is constantly being um, challenged, right? Due to the many factors that we know about. So I told people that if the tree was in really good health, the maximum, maximum that we would go would be 20%, right? And I think that that's fair to the tree because you don't want to take too much from a tree that's probably doing a little bit of struggling by itself. Then we're also, um, and, then, and then of course I went down from there, 15, 10, and then sometimes I said just remove dead wood, right? If the tree's not in good shape, but it's still alive, just remove dead wood. And then I said, well, why would we even remove dead wood? Then it's just going to look ugly. Well, dead wood doesn't, obviously doesn't do anything for the tree, and it's just a conduit for decay. 
So we talked a lot about that. Then um, we talked about X current and D current trees. I really emphasize that because again, I think that that concept, right, uh, was the sole factor that didn't uh, that didn't that people just didn't catch on to, and for that reason, I think they weren't using their poll tools as much. They weren't thinking about, am I trying to maintain a dominant leader, or am I just pruning, you know, for good structure and just getting rid of crossing branches, right? And you can see how much more simplified this is versus the other one, right? X current trees, you're trying to maintain a leader, right? And I taught them the mnemonic of like, a pine tree is X current. How do you remember that? Because it usually has a totally straight trunk with a bunch of, a bunch of auxiliary branches. It almost looks like an E, and everyone's like, <laughs> oh my god! And I'm like, yeah, simple mnemonics, it's good. It works really well, right? And I learned that from some of my colleagues that work a lot with stewards, because that tends, you know, people that aren't always intimately involved with uh, the science of pruning or with the science of planting or whatever tend to uh, respond very well to mnemonics. So correcting other defects, right? Crossing branches, narrow crotches, crowded branches, and then finally raising the crown, right? So taking off those lower limbs. We talked about X current and D current, obviously X current, D current. Okay, then we talked about execution, right? And this is where I think that um, my presentation, uh, or, uh, and, and I can see this in the quality of the cuts that are being made now, I think that this is where my true success was. Um, I'm not bragging, by the way, because remember that, that for the years before, there were thousands of trees with flush cuts on them. There's nothing to brag about, okay? But this, this I think was it. We explained the science of the branch bark ridge, the branch collar, and the branch protection zone. Right? And all I did was explain the fact that there's always a branch collar, but the branch collar is not always visible. Right? But there is always a branch bark ridge. Although sometimes the branch bark ridge looks more like included bark. Right? So we had to discuss that. And, and I, I talked about it by showing them my mnemonic, which is called the mountain versus the valley, right? And so the mountain is the branch bark ridge. Excuse me if I'm not being too scientific here, but this is really what works, right? The mountain is the branch bark ridge. It's where the tissues of the, of the trunk and the tissues of the branch meet in a perfect union, right? And they fuse together, and it's a strong, strong union, right? However, the valley is where the two tissues are just basically growing right up against each other, and there really is no attachment. You can see how easily the valley would break apart, right? So the valley ha always has to be addressed. Then we talked about the branch protection zone. The branch protection zone always exists within the branch collar, right? What does the branch protection zone do? The branch protection zone is where that reaction zone happens to allow for, the, for, um, for wood to properly grow over the wound. And that's where we emphasize the fact that trees don't heal, they seal, right? Trees grow over wounds, right? So the wound will always be there. And that was like another thing that sort of, I really needed to continuously reiterate. So during the presentation, in this, in this initial phase, this first, like, when we were covering this page, most of those concepts weren't totally there, right? As we went on and we discussed it throughout the presentation, I continued to harp on this, right? And I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, this really came to the surface and people really started to respond, right? And so here was, here was an instance where there is a collar, but it's not visible, right? And within the collar is the what, I would say to them, and they'd say, the branch protection zone. Actually, at this point, they weren't 100% about the branch protection zone. There was usually one or two, but not everybody, right? But there is a branch bark ridge, and therefore, this is how you make your cut, right? It's all about making that sort of 90 degree angle and then, and then making that perpendicular cut. Or, it's, excuse me, the bisecting cut. And then we talked about um, the three cut method, right, where you're reducing weight on the end of a branch um, with your first cut, the second cut actually, uh, excuse me, the undercut is the first cut, the second cut reduces the weight, and the third cut is just outside of the branch collar, which is your final cut, right? And so it just shows, it, and these two diagrams, again, taken straight out of the ANSI, and then I just always, I made it a little um, note about conifers, because we do plant some conifers on our streets, we plant Dawn Redwood, Taxodium, which is uh, bald cypress, and we also plant a couple different types of juniper, notably Juniperus chinensis hetzii, which is a vestigial uh, Chinese juniper. But I just wanted to emphasize that the branch collar on, um, on conifers is always visible, and it's a really, really straightforward cut. But the, the three cut method works the same way with them. So I just wanted to, I didn't want people, I didn't want that to be the thing that confused people if they saw it. And then again, I mean, this is taken straight out of like some Google image that I found, but I think it really worked, right? It's because it, because this doesn't 
you know, this kind of works, but to a person who is not seasoned, and this coming, and this uh, this year too, I wasn't just training uh, horde staff that had done this before. We also now have um, our mayor De Blasio recently passed what's called the Community Parks Initiative, which addresses lots of like little pocket parks throughout the whole city that have not been addressed um, with capital projects like you know improvements to playgrounds and uh, comfort stations, etc. Right, and they're and they're and they're focused in these uh, in certain neighborhoods. And so we also got funding uh, for, for horse staff to obviously you know, plant more perennials and shrubs and such. And so a lot of these horse staff, they can plant bulbs, but they don't, know how to plant, they don't know how to prune trees. So I really knew going into this that this was the only way to possibly get this, um, to, get, to reinforce these concepts. So by showing a simple diagram like this of the whole thing and just, again, reiterating what I said before, I think that it really helped. Then I took some snapshots from my favorite Shigo book. Um, which I think is, uh, man, now I'm trying to remember, um, God to Pruning or something like that. It's a great book. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so, right, so I had everything here, like, all printed out, and everyone's looking at it, and they're going, oh my God, really, that happens? Like, yeah, because a tree is a living thing, and it, and it responds uh, to the stimuli that we uh, present it with, right? And if we remove uh, the crucial components, the critical components, um, the tree will not be able to respond correctly. And so that was the, the, um, the take home message of the next few slides that I'm going to show you. Improper cuts remove the branch collar and thus the branch protection zone. These cuts directly wound the trunk. Right? And then I would, would run them through this. Both samples here were collected from the same tree. The one on the left was flush cut while the one on the right was cut correctly. What, was the crucial, com what crucial component was removed? And this is where they all said, oh, the branch collar. And therefore, what? Oh, the branch protection zone, right? Why is this important? Because the branch protection zone, blah, 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 right? What has happened on, in the sample on the right compared to the one on the left? And you can see that the one on the right is actually beginning to seal over the wound, right? So this was that critical moment. And this is why I wanted to also show, right? Flush cuts destroy a major tree defense system, right? And then, and I and I read through the whole thing, and I explained to them that you know these darkened lines is, are actually um, uh, decay fungi, uh, de decay pathogens beginning to move through the stem of the tree. I was like, if you remove the branch collar, you're basically leaving an open avenue for a tree to rot from within, but not in the, not in like the natural way that we want it to, right? And what I kind of and and I basically told them, like, the amazing thing about young trees is that they're very resilient, right? And so you might not see this as a problem now, because it'll just look like it's sealed over, but this always remains. And as this decay pathogen begins to move through the trunk of the tree, I was like, in 10 to 20 years, you're going to have, you know, a 10,000 pound uh, tube, essentially, right, that is ready to fall and kill someone. And that usually made mouths hang open and, oh my god, really? Yes. And so taking it to that extent really helped. And it helped much more than those first few slides I showed you of the wonky trees. That didn't seem to go anywhere the first two years. But talking to people and, ha and them having seen the devastation during Sandy, I think that it started to ring through. Right? The importance of not leaving stubs, explaining that if you actually don't stimulate basically what happens in the, in the, in the um, branch protection zone, you're essentially also left with a conduit for decay. But also emphasizing that I'd rather they leave stubs than leave flush cuts. And why is that? Because you can correct the stub, right? You can always remove wood, you just you can never put it back, right? And then I presented them with this and I gave everybody their moment to be artistic and I said, what would you do? And they're like, well, I cut it. And I'd be like, that's very broad and good, but what would you cut? I said, do, would you? so there are probably like 10 stems there. And they're like, yeah, that's crazy. And I was like, well, this is a real picture. You know, this is taken out on the streets. And they said, okay. And I said, so, like, would you take, you know, all of them but one? And they're like, no, definitely not. We would subordinate a bunch of them. And that's, I think that's what I knew. I think that's what I knew. But, and so then I showed them an inside view of the difference between a, a branch bark ridge, right, the one on the left, versus included bark, where you can see those two tissues just pushing up against each other and nothing happening, right? There's no actual union between them. And I didn't show them this as much, but I, but I did want to show you guys just because I think it's really interesting. Tissues of the bark and the wood of the branch and trunk come together in the collar. It can be thought of as a switching zone. This is taken straight out of Shigo. He just, he just makes um, 
these concepts to the semi-advanced professional, so accessible to you know your average Joe, whoever wants to learn how to prune, just needs to know these basic concepts. And that's what I was trying to, to get through to people. I was like, anybody can prune. You don't have to be an ISA certified arborist. You don't have to be an academic. You don't have to know, uh, you know, uh, every little bit about the tree and its species epithet and all this other crazy stuff. You don't need to know that. You just need to know how a tree works, and you need to work in tandem with that, right? So proper pruning of branches with included bark, the inside view, and then this was my final thing, right? And I said, okay, class, the tree on the left that has the ABC above it is this an X current or D current tree? Who knows? It is X current, and that was always a really uh, and that was uh, so X current tree has a has a uh, a dominant leader, okay? Um, as opposed to not having a dominant leader being a D current and more spreading habit. And so this was one of the things that I emphasized with them. This is also taken straight out of Vancey. This is not some drawing that I made, right? But a lot of times the young trees that you'll walk up on the street will look a lot like this, okay? And they'll have um, multiple leaders, and you have to address it. And I said, okay, so after light pruning, why would we only do light pruning? And people would think about it, and I'd say, so what was one of the first concepts that we talked about in the now easy to use flowchart? Tree health, right? And we're talking about the idea that maybe this tree, right, assuming that it's somewhere on the street, maybe it's got a ding in its, in its, uh, in its trunk, right? Maybe a, a car ran into it. This happens all the time anymore. Right? Maybe uh, a dog has been peeing on it for the last 10 years, right? Or uh, any other number of things that, any other number of challenges that are presented to trees when they're on the street, right? So maybe light pruning is all that was caused, it, all that was called for. But if you think about the, right, if you think about the, um, I just want to flip back really quickly, right? But if you think about the flow chart, right, the first thing that we're looking at is, um, tree health, right? And then we're assessing, is it X current or D current? And so what, and so even after light pruning, the first thing that we're trying to do is to maintain that leader. So now going back, there it is, right? And you can see that that main leader, the dominant leader, the dominant trunk was, um, was maintained. Now, if the tree is in a little bit better health, right? And I presented this also as a question, why would we go moderate pruning? And then, then they were like, Oh, well, obviously, because it's in better health. And okay, great, that's that's awesome. And I was really happy when people gave me those duh moments because that means that it's there, right? It's all there, and that's good. So, so I think that that, that was also very helpful and helped to sort of tie the loop. Um, now, this is quality control 2015. This was just the last month. This is up in the Bronx, and I was unfortunately disappointed to still see some problems, right? But such is the reality of the work that we do. It can't always be perfect. We're trying to prune, you know, two to three thousand trees in each borough. Think some things are going to go wrong, right? And so you can see uh, one of the main issues in this is that those co-dominant leaders were not addressed, and this is going to become a problem because this is a linden, and I don't have a laser pointer, but if you can see the crotch where those two main leaders are starting to sprout from, mm -hmm. there's some serious included bark in there. And that's going to become a problem because at some point, if there's too much weight on the one branch on the left or on the right, it's going to split. And that tree will no longer be an asset, right? It's going to become a serious hazard to somebody or it's going to have to be taken down altogether. Now, what if we just removed, right? Let's say that tree's not in great health. It's actually in fairly decent health. What if we just removed, like, a part of that, um, a part of that leader on the left? We could basically solve this tree's structural problems. It's as easy as that. It's one, maybe two cuts at the most. Maybe take one or two of the limbs at the bottom and walk away, right? We're not talking about a massive operation. We don't need bucket trucks. We don't need chippers. It's just a couple small branches. They're not, they're not thicker than my arm, right? And so that's, again, the key that I was, uh, some of the concepts that I was trying to drive at. Same thing here, right? This is a ginkgo. Ginkgo is an ex-current tree, right? You, don't, you can't see it here, but they did a great job uh, raising the crown, taking off some of the lower branches, right? This tree's now like probably 17 or 18 feet tall. It's, pretty, it's a pretty nice tree, right? But it's got these co-dominant leaders at the top. There's probably some sort of stress at the very, uh, a little bit earlier in the tree's life because ginkgo's a fairly slow growing species, but those look like they've got some, uh, quite a bit of growth on them, those, those top like four or five little stems. This was as simple also as just taking the pole pruner 
reaching up and making four small cuts. So this was some of the thing. This was one of the things that I was trying to bring to people's attention. And again, you know, if I if I may, uh, just quickly, you know, in, in my own uh, reflection on this, right, in terms of my teaching method, I decided that the added layer that's going to have to happen this year is that I'm going to have to reconvene with every one of those same classes and show them these pictures now, as opposed to next year or later this year. You know, when we do the trainings all over again to reinforce the concepts and say. Dude, didn't we just go over this like a month and a half ago? And what did I, you know, what, what uh, did, what, were the tools not available to you? Because that's obviously one thing, right? If they're not available, then that's no one's fault. It is, it is what, except for maybe the managers, right, who are doling out the tools. Um, but if, if, the, if the capability and the confidence wasn't there, then that's my problem, right? I need to be able to give that to them as the instructor, right? And I need to fill them with that knowledge and that confidence. So. I don't know what went wrong here, and that's what I. And that's the next, the next small part of the mystery that I need to figure out. Because if I can address this issue, I think I've got it down, right? I think that we, I think that parks can start to move forward with a really good, high quality, most true group program that has hardly any substantial, um, like sort of aesthetic effect on a tree, and does an incredible job of maintaining that tree at a young age. Now. There were some really good moments too, right? This is a fairly large, um, what's known as a, some people call it Sephora, some people call it Stephanolobium, it's known as Pagoda tree, it's a Japanese tree. And I just outlined this, this one didn't have a ton of cuts on it, but you can see a couple here and there. They're made really well, and in addition to that, they've actually, this is a team on Staten Island, they've actually maintained a, a really good dominant leader. You can't see it from here, but these branches here were reduced a little bit to prevent this, branch, uh, this main branch here on the, on the left from growing too, too large. It's already quite big. But it's a good, it's, it's got a good, it's got a good attachment. It's got that branch bark ridge. So I was also happy that they realized that they were doing the right thing. And then finally, this tulip tree, you can see that these cuts were great. They're not stubby. They're not flush cuts, right? They preserved the branch collar. They were clearly, uh, somehow the messages of the, of, of the course were resounding in their heads. And that was all I could ask for, right? Seeing a couple of these and a couple of the bads, it always balances it out. But now I know, I think I know how to, how to close the circle. And for me, it's all about closing that loop, right? Because, again, just as I want to imbue you guys with the confidence to go out and be able to prune trees, I want to imbue them too, right, with that confidence. And um, I think that that just takes a lot of reflection and constant experimenting. and. But this year we've done an amazing job, and we've pruned 12,500 trees, right? That's, that's freaking awesome, right? Considering that we've planted about 20,000 trees per year for the last seven years. So, I mean, we're never, we're probably not going to catch up very soon unless we have a serious delay in planting, but that's okay, right? These trees are constantly going through cycles, right? Where some are coming out of guarantee and some are, some are just being planted and young at that stage. But I think that now, and now if we're talking about closing the loop, right? Now we've got this amazing tree procurement program which starts the trees um, at a really high quality. And then we've got this amazing tree planting program that makes sure that those trees are put in the ground correctly. And then finally, we've got this Young Street Tree Pruning Program, which is going to bring them into the final cycle of their lives as an object of maintenance, right? But, but, as a, but as a really, as continuing to gain its net worth, right? To really becoming a passive and an investment. So with that, I just want to say thank you. I think we have time for a few questions, if people have the energy. Thoughts now that we're all professional pruners? <laughs> yes. I'm just wondering how many uh, pruning interventions are you expecting each young tree to have before it moves on to uh, sort of a more mature tree maintenance cycle? That's a, that's a great question. Um, my, some of the stuff that I've been talking about with, um, if you guys were here a few months ago, Jeremy Barrett, who's the deputy chief of our division, he and I talk about this all the time. And one of the things that I want to start to integrate because we are starting to now generate some of this data, right? We have this tracking and it's getting better and better. I want to start folding in probably this coming year in 2016, I want to start folding in those trees that were first pruned, right? Ideally, in my mind, this would happen two, maybe three times before um, 
before it, you know, the, the trees are, are very large and have to be maintained by borough forestry. But I think that like this this would address the trees that like, oh, we have to subordinate a branch, but we need to come back to it in a couple of years, right? Because the idea is that you're trying to suppress the growth on the branch, but if you suppress it and then don't come back to it, then I mean it's kind of a toss-up, right? So ideally in my mind it's probably two to three times. Anyone else? So you're saying the first two years the trees are planted on contract and they're maintained by yes. the planter? Do yep. they get training? Uh, do they, in, in, what, in what respect? Do they know what they're doing when it comes to pruning? There are def uh, pruning not as much, and we don't require them necessarily to prune their trees during, uh, during their maintenance. A lot of times those trees are small enough that um, any corrective pruning, even our, even our foresters can do. And I honestly don't trust them that much. A lot of them are... Uh, very good at using you know machines and making sure that those trees get installed properly. But when it comes down to like a little bit more of the finesse end of things, there are some that are really good and there are some that aren't. So we don't always require that of them unless it's like a broken branch and we make them prune that out. Any other questions? Um. Can you speak at all to the relationship, or maybe there is no relationship, but between this program and the Trees New York Citizen Pruners program? Oh, that's, oh man, you're, thank you. I somewhat blanked on that because uh, we worked very closely with Trees New York on the first, uh, like sort of the pilot year of this. When the, Right now, the, this program has a very, very meager budget, right? Um, but it's great because we're going to continue to push forward and we're doing excellent work and I think that it has a lot of potential. But uh, before we really had a budget, we had stewards, right? And we still continue to encourage Trees New York to work with their stewards. And um, myself and uh, two former colleagues of mine who now actually work out in Santa Monica um, were working with us. And uh, we worked with Trees New York, and we would go out there with like a, it was like a band of 20 of us, and we would just prune trees. And um, they were great because we were able to bring them in and basically teach them the older version of the course that I sort of, uh, you know, shortened for you guys. And uh, that was sort of like called the Advanced Tree Care, I think, I think we called it, or Advanced Citizen Crew, do a lot of the Young's Tree Pruning that we were talking about on a, on a large level. I think with them we ended up printing about 400 trees. So are they not, are they sort of disbanded now, or are they continue, do they continue to? It's hard to say. They were partially on a grant uh, that we gave them through Million Trees NYC. Um, but we decided that uh, the in-house program would be more effective, especially in the way of numbers, and you know how government is. Government is very, very numbers driven. Um, and yeah, so that, that was sort of it. But they, some of them work, still work alongside us um, at little events, but it's, it's largely now what I was specifically referring to is, is almost like the in-house part. Yes? How do you make the case to there's a very strong orientation to planet. Everybody thinks they're doing wonders for the world and the planet. But how do you make the case for making older trees maintaining their health? What's the comparative advantage to having a healthy old tree versus uh, you know, a, a new promising tree? What, what's the dollar value or the... Uh, oh man, I don't have my eye tree stats here. I wish I did, but... Um, we know that you know a, a healthy, mature London plane is worth you know exponentially more than a young tree, right? And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that that all my colleagues do too. Tree preservation is something that we need to get better and better at. Um, and I'm talking about the city of New York, but I'm also talking. I, I'm going to go ahead and generalize here, right? Because I think that very often, I, I said this before too. I think that planting has this like very sexy appeal to it. People want to do it. It's a, it's a great way to engage people, but it takes, you know, professionals who are using large machines and, and you know, dangerous, like, uh, chainsaws and such to maintain a large tree sometimes. And, so, but often, you know, capital improvement projects get a lot more funding than maintenance projects. And, I mean, you call me an, an idealist, but I think that, uh, that maintenance really should, in a certain sense, part, certain parts of maintenance should be considered capitally eligible, right? Because you're continuing to expound on the, the worth of that investment, right? You've put a million dollars into a project, 
put a million dollars more to make it worth two million dollars. Maybe at that point it would be worth three million dollars because of the because of the uh, the net value of those trees and their benefits. So um, I don't have the exact numbers for you, but I but I agree with you wholeheartedly. You're doing more than just deadhead. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, it, the New York City's pruning practices are not bad at all whatsoever. I just don't think that they have enough funding to move them to the proper, you know, to the level that they're supposed to be at. We shouldn't be on a seven-year pruning cycle. We should be pruning trees every two to three years at the most. You know, I think that's me. Yes. And just a, more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Um, in, in the vein of money should be put towards maintenance. So, uh, in my opinion, an ideal example of what you're talking about is the schoolyard greening projects that uh, are supported in Toronto, where uh, parents will work with the Toronto District School Board, and they could get all this money from um, Evergreen and all that to plant trees. So naturally, I did this with my daughter's school, except I'm also a biology professor. So I was very interested in doing follow-up, looking at the kinds of trees that they were recommending, which were ridiculous. The list had no science basis to it whatsoever. It was just a bizarre mishmash of some pseudoscience over there. And when you questioned them, they were, oh, we don't want to know about that. But when I tried, although my kids are now in university and high school, but when um, we did all this work with this planting and butterfly gardens and this, that, and there had been butterfly gardens 10 years previously that had been neglected. So I said, what we need is actually a succession plan. So that as one wave of engaged parents leaves, the next wave will come in and they'll have the documents and they'll know what was done. So you're not constantly reinventing this wheel. Right. Is there any interest in Toronto at an institutional level? No, because the flash and dash and the newspaper articles are for going and putting in a new garden, whereas the trees, oh hey Peter, subsequently they will die, they're not maintained, they're not pruned. And so you're constantly resetting back to zero, and it's terribly, terribly expensive. And what it actually means that if you do a full cost accounting or a life cycle analysis, it becomes a very expensive endeavor with very little return on investment. Um, so don't worry, it's not just you, it's happening to the tune of millions <laughs> oh, I, I, I know it is. Right there. <laughs> I know it right is. there. I know it is, and it, there, there, there needs to be, there needs to be a more holistic mm. view of how you know investments are made, right? And um, I don't know, the, the, it, it's something that I've been you know fighting for for a little while, and it's gotten some attention. I think that it's doing good work, and I just hope I want to keep making it better so that it has you know feet to stand on, and um, we'll see where it goes. Do you, have a, do you have a sense of how long those trees, if you follow this pruning cycle, and you're able to do and everything? You've done the best you can. Do you guys have a sense or discussions about how long these trees will live? Like, maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel as quickly. Like, that's why we're doing it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that <laughs> trees, trees, what trees think likelihood is? to fail on the street probably uh, is uh, contingent on more factors than a tree that's, like, sitting, again, in yeah. a botanic garden. Right. But usually it's structural problems that cause trees right. to fail. Uh, fail or 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 they were not planted in the right place, right? That is usually that's that's a lot of the time what happens, and then the structural problems and um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, I'm sorry. Now I'm getting now I'm getting tired. But um, it, the the disease pathologies are usually very closely related to where to where that tree was initially planted. I think that. That our program, the, the beauty of it is that it puts so much emphasis on a great quality tree being planted in the right place, and I think that this young tree pruning program is is like the icing on the cake, right? It's it's what's going to hopefully ensure that that tree lasts. I hope, you know, they used to say. I think we were talking about this earlier. I think that they were like, oh, doesn't a tree, a uh, street tree, usually last like about ten, seven to ten years or something like that? I don't think that that's true. I know that that's an average, but if you walk around the city, the streets of New York, and the few streets I've walked along in Toronto, there are trees that are much older than 10 years, right? But those trees need just as much attention as any other tree, and they and they deserve to have that attention from the time that they're you know only five years in the ground to the time that they're 55 years in the ground. 
Um, so we don't have good data. We no, should, no. You should leave some of your trees unpruned. <laughs> see how long that lasts. I think I already let's have. Run, <laughs> okay, let's run an experiment and let's see. Like you should double their lifespan by pruning, I would hope. I hope so too. Yes? Does your power utility and, and the city have two different garden harvests going at these trees? <sighs> Unfortunately, one of the more primitive. Am I still being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> It, it's it's true. There, there's there's a point of contention because um, because the utility company uh, can like basically especially when it comes to like removing a tree that's under power lines or something like that. The utility company needs to come first, and typically they you know do some sort of hack job, and then uh, you know our our pruners through our in-house crews or our contract crews will remove uh, usually what's left of the shack. Unfortunately, pruning under wires is such a challenge because it is usually left to the utility companies to do. Does Toronto have a very similar problem? Yes. Yeah. And and that's and that's you know that that principle alone is what is what is causing us to largely plant small ornamental trees under wires that will need very little maintenance. Um, as opposed to large shade trees. Mm -hmm. We're trying to experiment with using, um, well, I, I, I actually don't know, because like some people say, put, plant the tree that's got a great leader so that all you need to do is just like remove a branch that's right next to it. And some people are like, well, no, you want a tree that you know really spreads, so all you need to do is remove little parts of the middle. <laughs> I don't know what's right. Basically, I think that trees and power lines don't go well. They weren't meant to be. And I think it's better to, um, to you know, just plant the right tree under wires, right? One that will not get very big. Or bury the wire. Or bury the wire. <laughs> but usually that yeah, leads to root excavation. That's so, a, yeah. um, that's a, so, yeah. oh, what are these things? They're not utility lines. Let's cut them. Yeah. That's just a problem. OK, there's no Anything more else? questions. Thank you guys so much. It was really nice to present to you all today. Thank you.